Assessment of thyroid function is essential in a wide variety of clinical scenario across all ages and pubertal stages. Given the varied physiology of thyroid in different aspects and life stages, it's important to understand thyroid physiology in totality so as to ensure appropriate and uh, correct interpretation of thyroid functions. The thyroid gland produces the T4 hormone which in fact acts as a pro-hormone and is in turn converted into T3 hormone. Both of these hormones bind to the thyroxine binding globulin and it's the free fraction which is the free T3 and free T4 which are the predominant action points as far as thyroid function is concerned and they act on the endorphin. So while total T3 and T4 may be a reliable status if the TBG levels are normal, in pathological situations where the TBG levels may be low like liver disease or exogenous estrogen therapy, total hormones may not be a very reliable way of assessing thyroid functions and in this regard it may be appropriate to look at free hormones and not the total hormones in this situation. The other important thing to remember is that the peripheral conversion of T4 and T3 is dependent upon the actual status of T3 hormones. So in situations of hypothyroidism, there would be disproportionately greater conversion of T4 to T3. So therefore, the T4 to T3 ratio will be reduced and T3 levels will be maintained for a longer duration despite hypothyroidism, indicating a sort of adaptive response. So therefore, T3 levels will be the most unreliable markers of hypothyroidism in individuals who have primary or thyroidal basis of hypothyroidism. The thyroid gland is in turn controlled by the pituitary by the secretion of TSH, which in turn is regulated by the hypothalamus by the secretion of the thyrotropin releasing hormone. Within this substrata, as we discussed, that if somebody has hypothyroidism, the first feedback response would be the pituitary to increase the level of TSH. And that TSH will not only increase production of T4, but also increase the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. So therefore, T3 levels will be the last to fall and T3 is therefore the least sensitive marker of primary hypothyroidism. We also remember from this state that total hormones may be variable. So in clinical situations where the TBG levels may be affected, we should be measuring free hormones and not just the total hormones. And similarly, the first change to happen in a primary hypothyroid state is the increase in TSH levels followed by fall in T4 and finally fall in T3. So TSH is the best marker for primary hypothyroidism, but it will have no role to play in a child who has central hypothyroidism. There are hormonal crosstalks which also happen and particularly two of them are very relevant. One is the crosstalk between the TSH and the FSH receptor and the alpha unit of TSH has similarity to FSH receptor. So in situations wherein very high levels of TSH, it may act on the FSH receptor causing stimulation of the SH receptor causing precocious puberty and this unique form of precocious puberty in untreated girls with hypothyroidism associated with delayed bone age and short stature. The other crosstalk is that the TRH or the thyrotropin releasing hormone is also a stimulatory hormone for prolactin. So, Uncontrolled primary hypothyroidism is associated with increased level of hypothalamic release of TRH and subsequently can also result in hyperprolactinemia. So thyroid function assessment is absolutely important by these two crosstalks in girls who have ovarian cysts, girls who have precocious puberty and those who present to us with hyperprolactinemia or galactoria. Another important thing to remember out of this feedback mechanism is that uncontrolled primary hypothyroidism will result in significant elevation of TSH or thyrotrop hyperplasia which may go up to the extent to being diagnosed actually as a pituitary mass lesion which in fact is a diffuse thyrotrop hyperplasia. Once these children are actually put on thyroid hormone, the pituitary hyperplasia subsides and the size of pituitary glands come down. 
So if you have a situation wherein the TSH levels are very high and there is, appears to be a TSH secreting lesion, one doesn't need to worry. Start thyroxine replacement and the child will improve both clinically as well as in the form of neuroimaging pictures. Having understood this physiology, what we can really get is that the best way to assess thyroid function in the child is to look at the free T4 and the TSH levels. So if you have a situation where the free T4 are low, we'll then interpret based upon the TSH levels. If the TSH levels are also low, so low free T4, low TSH would indicate that we are dealing with what is known as central or secondary hypothyroidism. On the other end, if the free T4 levels are low and the TSH levels are high, it is clearly indicative of the garden variety of primary hypothyroidism. In an individual with normal FT4, if the TSH levels are low, it may be an indicator of subclinical thyrotoxicosis or hyperthyroidism for which no treatment is required. But if TSH is elevated, it could be a marker of subclinical hypothyroidism, which is an area of uncertainty as far as pediatric practice is concerned. On the other hand, if you have FT4, which is high and low TSH, this is a classical case of overt thyrotoxicosis. While both high TSH and high FT4 is an extremely, extremely rare situation of either a pituitary resistance to TSH uh, thyroid hormone secretion or a very rare cause of a TSH secreting adenoma, which is should not be considered in routine clinical practice. So just by clinical assessment of FT4 and TSH, we can broadly classify an individual into a euthyroid, hypo or hyperthyroid state. We need to keep a few things in mind, however, that there is a significant diurnal variation within the thyroid hormone as well as interday variation, which is of a significant impact. The TSH variations are however not to the tune to really affect clinically. So TSH levels can be done any time of the day, but T4 levels are affected by the intake of the tablet and should therefore be done in an individual who has hypothyroidism just before the drug is taken. The half-life of thyroid hormones is typically one week. So the levels of TSH stabilizes within six weeks. So there's no point repeating levels very quickly after changing the dose weight for at least six to eight weeks before you do that. You should all be aware that during stress, thyroid functions will go haywire. We can have what is known as non thyroidal illness in which TSH levels may be low, normal or high depending on the stage of thyroid function that we're looking at. So as a rule of thumb, Please do not assess thyroid functions in a sick child admitted to the ICU unless there are clear-cut pointers towards hypo or hyperthyroidism like bradycardia or tachycardia, hypothermia or hyperthermia or unexplained cardiac failure, encephalopathy or hyponatremia. Neonatal period understanding of physiology is extremely important because as soon as the child is born, because of the cold stress, there is a surge of TRH hormone, which results in a rapid rise of TSH, which gradually comes down over a period of around one to two weeks. So therefore, when you're really assessing a child, we should use a cutoff only after 72 hours of delivery, because that is the time when the thyroid function would have stabilized to a certain extent. In situations wherein we are dealing with early deliveries, a higher cutoff may be used because if you're looking at early discharges, then those cutoffs will be different from the 72 hour cutoff in that regard. In sick individuals, particularly in preterm infants, there may be a variation as far as TSH surge is concerned. And therefore, there should be a repeat thyroid function done at around two to six weeks of age. What about the normal thyroid hormone levels? And this is a big, big confusion. What we can see here is the TSH levels rapidly fall down from around 18 to 20 to a level of around 8 at one month of life. These are the 95th percentile. And then gradually, they remain stable and stay around 5. And uh, these are with regards to the levels of FT4, which are very high at birth, and then gradually stabilize. So often a question which comes to our mind is that what level of thyroid hormone, especially TSH, should we be concerned about? So any individual who has a level of more than 40, 
in the first week of life, more than 20 in the second week of life, and more than 10 beyond one month of life is significant and one need to be cautious in terms of evaluation and treatment. And these are the 97.5 percentile cutoffs which are given for different age groups. So between 1 to 12 months, the upper limit is around 8.21 and subsequently the figures come.